Okay, welcome back. Um, we now know what polytopes are, we know what extreme points are, uh, and we know that a linear optimization problem has optimal solutions at extreme points. Just this idea is powerful in and of itself because it tells us that even though we have infinitely many feasible points, we only need to check uh, a finite number of them. Again, this is not that exciting because I mentioned at the, uh, 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 in an earlier lecture that we could have a huge number, vast number of these. But, but in any case, it's, it is uh, if we were you know, starting in the, in the early days and we were just verifying whether this paradigm made sense, it's interesting that we can write down a problem with infinitely many um, feasible points and solve in finite amount of time by just enumerating all of the extreme points. And the simplex algorithm says, well, instead of just by brute force enumerating all of the extreme points, okay, I also know how to draw another three-dimensional shape. Um, maybe we could uh, go from uh, corner point to corner point until we find um, the optimal one. We know we have the benefit of convexity, and convexity tells us that if none of your immediate, uh, if, if nobody right around you is, is more enticing than you, then actually you're at a global optimal solution. And we also know that uh, in the case of linear optimization, a special case of convex optimization, we're going to be we only need to look at the extreme points. So these ideas together gives us this proto-proto idea, intuition for, uh, for an algorithm. So this lecture and the next one are going to develop this, this into a uh, more specific, um, more specific um, algorithm. But, the, but, but this picture tells us quite a bit about what the simplex algorithm wants to do. The reason that we're developing the simplex algorithm here is not because I think that you're going to go and implement it or, or even that you should. So just as an aside, this course is not about solving large scale problems in a stable and, and fast way. Um, and if you were to try to implement simplex algorithm and compete against Gurobi or Cplex, you would see that you get crushed. And that's really because there are uh, there are so many heuristics that that can dramatically speed up the stability and speed for large-scale optimization problems. Um, but in fact, the simplex algorithm is going to give us a, a better theoretical understanding of what linear optimization and duality do, and we're also going to be able to use this in, uh, in, for, for developing algorithms uh, later on down the road. So th this is why we're talking about um, the, simplex, the simplex algorithm. Okay, so uh, the basic basic idea. Let's let's try to put this in a more uh, algebraic framework. So we know that if x is an extreme point of P, then as we saw in a previous lecture, that means that there exists a basis B. B is a subset of one to n. Um, we are in n. We are in n dimensions. The size of B is equal to M. And X, I can partition as the indices that are in B and the indices that are not in B. The indices that are not in B are N minus M. Those must be equal to zero. And again, XB, just in order to satisfy AX equals B, which are our equality constraints, has to be equal to uh, AB inverse B where a b is equal to the m columns of a corresponding to indices of b and therefore in particular a b is an m by m matrix and i can and i can invert it and so everything that i've written down here uh, makes sense so what is the value of this x that I wrote down, it's just C transpose x, which writing out the coefficients, is C has a part again that's 
in, cof in, the, in the coefficients specified by B and, and those outside. So this is equal to CB transpose XB plus CB complement transpose XB complement, but we said that's zero. So this is just CB transpose XB. And in fact, we already know what that is. CB transpose A B inverse times B. So this is the value. Again, I'm belaboring this point, but as soon as we choose a subset of uh, the N indices, we immediately get XB, we get our solution to the optimization problem, and we get its value. These are all continuous, continuous objects that are specified by this combinatorial, combinatorial choice. All right, now I want to move to an adjacent edge. So what do I have to do? I need to choose a different basis that uh, has um, m minus one uh, common elements. So if I were to be completely naive, I would enumerate over all possible n minus m choices of what to add and over all m choices of what to take out. Okay, so we're not gonna be, we're not gonna be that naive. We're gonna just be somewhat, uh, somewhat naive and we're just going to, we're just going to pick uh, one of the n minus m choices that we could add. Um, so, so, so uh, I'm going to move to an adjacent extreme point. How am I going to do that? I'm going to pick some element i hat that is not in b. And I'm going to put that in my new basis. And now I'm going to I'm going to see which of them. It, I, I'm, I'm, this is not my super naive solution because we're going to see that it's we're going to we're going to naturally learn which of the elements of of B is going to exit. Um, but we're going to but we're still going to improve this this choice going down the line. Okay, so so this is so my new B contains uh, definitely contains I hat. It contains nothing else that's not in B. Right, so, so let me just write this out. B uh, new is a subset of B old and this special I hat that I've chosen. And, we, and so I need to just throw out one of the things from one of the things from B. So, uh, so uh, and I'm going to figure out what my new basis is and also what my new solution is by uh, making sure that I'm still satisfying all of my equality constraints. So let's write it in this way. So what is my, um, um, so I need to determine, I must determine which element of B is uh, is going to leave. So let's uh, let's figure this out, and let's write it in this way. So my x new is let me write it as my x old plus some multiple theta times the direction that I'm going to go in. Okay. So so again, you know, if this is if this is my shape here, you know, if you want to move from this extreme point to this extreme point. Again, you've, you've chosen a direction and, and you're moving. So, uh, so let's, let's, let's figure out what is, what do we know about D? Right, if I'm, if I'm going to, if I, just by writing it in this way, what do I know? Well, I know that D I hat, the element of D that corresponds to that I hat, I hat element that I want to add, that has to be non-zero. So, um, I'm going to call that one because I have my scaling parameter theta. And also I know that X nu has support. Let's just go back to the previous slide. So B nu is a subset of B and I hat. So every, every element of X nu that is not I hat or not somewhere in my current B has to be zero. So that means that I know that um, D uh, J is equal to zero for any j that's not in b or equal to i hat. Right. So 
ones. Those, those are zero. Um, and I just don't know what db is. So that means that, so, so what do we know? So d is equal to, again, abusive notation here, db, whatever, whatever are the coefficients on the basis of, uh, that we had. I've got a one in the i hat location and a zero everywhere else. So this is the i hat location. This is, this is what d is. So now let's write out feasibility conditions. I need ax nu equal to b. I need ax nu greater than or equal to zero. So ax nu equal to b, what does this tell me? It tells me that ax plus theta ad is equal to b, but ax is already equal to b, so it must be that ad is equal to zero. But what is ad? Remember when we multiply a matrix by a, by a, by a column vector, uh, the vector is just multiplying each of the columns of the matrix. So, uh, so this, this equation here exactly reads that uh, a i hat times one, which is d i hat, plus a b d b is equal to zero. The third term I omitted, it's a b complement of i and b times you know all the zeros that are in d so i so i, I just uh, just omit that and we now have uh, the solution of uh, we know what db is so db is equal to minus a b inverse times a i hat so that means that uh that x nu is equal to xb zero plus theta times db we have that sitting right there minus a b inverse a i hat one which is that i hat element and then zero everything else so we have to determine what theta is And you can see from this picture up top what's, what, what's going to happen. So when you're moving from here to here, this is how you move when theta grows. Theta certainly has to be greater than or equal to zero. Why does it have to be greater than or equal to zero? It has to be greater than or equal to zero. Let me put a zero in the, let me also put a zero in the i, I hat position of x. Because the i hat position of x is gonna take the value theta times one. So theta has to be one. Remember, I also need, I need x nu to be greater than or equal to zero. So we're gonna determine theta by basically the picture says, determine theta, you're gonna eventually run into one of these borders here. And when you go on the other side, what's happening? You're violating a an inequality constraint. The only inequalities here are the x greater than or equal to zero. So looking at these is going to tell us exactly what is theta. Okay, so again, we need theta greater than or equal to zero, and we also need x b minus theta a b inverse a i hat, this is my d b, to be greater than or equal to zero. Note that we all, all automatically satisfy a x nu equals b is satisfied for all values of theta by construction. That's how we, we, we designed it. Um, and so uh, we can just we just compare uh, element element wise, and we find that theta is the smallest value of the ratio of x j over d j, where j is an element of b such that d j is positive. Again, if d j is not positive. You can go as far as you want in that direction. If, if, if one of these coefficients is negative, as far as that's concerned, you are just increasing the ith co the j that, that jth coefficient of, of, of x. So you're, you're gonna be you're gonna be non-negative, so you're you're fine. Three things can happen. One, we could find that theta is greater than zero and finite. And this, and this will happen if, you know, if xj is positive, 
and dj is positive. It could be plus infinity. How could that happen? Well, that's if we don't have a bounded polytope. So we have you know, inequalities like this in two dimensions where you know, it goes infinitely in this in in that direction. So from there, you could you, know, you could start moving you could start moving off. So this this would happen if all dj's are less than or equal to 0. But it could also be 0. We could find that we actually changed basis and we didn't move at all. So how could that happen? Algebraically, we know from this expression exactly how that could happen. This will happen uh, if um, there's some xj that's equal to 0 and the corresponding dj is positive, and therefore you cannot subtract at all from it. What does this correspond to um, geometrically? So let's just quickly draw the picture. So let's let me draw this shape here. What this is supposed to, supposed to be is kind of this multi-beveled shape. And you can see that this is in three dimensions. This point is uh, defined by many different, um, many different uh, uh, equality constraints. So I could change my basis, but not move um, at all. This is what I was supposed to draw here, the picture of those three cases. But we already we already discussed it. Um, so these are the three things that uh, could happen. And um, what's left? You know, we've described how to move to an extreme point, uh, to to an adjacent extreme point. We've described the algebraic view of that. What's left is asking: um, Did we improve? We need to bring in the objective function. So far, we've only been talking about the feasible constraints. In the next lecture, we will, we, will talk about, uh, we will talk about this, and it will also give us an idea of how is it that we pick that i hat. We're not going to enumerate over all of them. We're only going to pick the ones that, are, uh, that have the potential to have us improve. We're going to stop there, and we will pick this up uh, next time.